Welcome, my name is Sarah Oxley and I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. Tonight, it is my pleasure to host Kea Persinen, um, who is the author of the novel of the novels, The Ruins of Us, which earned a Michener Copernus Award and the Unraveling of Mercy Lewis, which won an Alex Award from the American Library Association. Her work has appeared in the New York Review of Books daily, the Gulf Coast, The Southern Review, The Washington Post, Slate, Salon, The Lonely Planet Travel, Writing Anthologies, among others, and is forthcoming in Letters to a Stranger, Essays to Those Who Haunt Us. Recipient of fellowships from McDowell, Yaddo, and Hedgebrook, also Vermont Studio Center, in 2019, I think he said. Um, she is currently an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Kenyon College where she serves as consulting editor for the Kenyon Review. Thanks so much for being here, Kaya. Um, I think you'll, we're planning on having you read for us and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for that introduction and thanks for hosting me. It's really special to connect with Vermont Studio Center and that community again, that residency two years ago, as I was telling you a little bit in the chat um, before we got started, was sort of the last time I was really in community with a group of artists and um, before the shutdown and the COVID shutdown. And so I just often like would draw on my memories of, of that time and those people. And I, you know, I'm still connected via text and email with several people that I met there. It was a really special cohort and just a magical place. So yeah, I'm honored to be back as visiting writer. Wish I could be in person, but you know, maybe someday. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, We'll have you come back in the future. Yes, that would be wonderful. Um, but yeah, I'm going to just read a little bit um, of uh, my novel in progress. Uh, the working title of that book is The Book of Fate. And this is actually the book I was working on when I was in residence at VSC. And I finished my rough draft there after working on this draft for three years. I had been working on a rough draft and I only just finished it. <laughs> at VSC and it was amazing. We celebrated by me and this other um, guy, Kurt, and um, another friend of ours named Iris. She, we, we all had finished like drafts of our books during our residency. So we printed them up and we got champagne and we stood on our drafts and, you know, popped the bottles of champagne and had like a big party for our drafts. Um, and that was inspired by something I had read once about uh, what Elizabeth McCracken and Ann Patchett had done when they were at um, Provincetown. They were um, in residence there and they had like finished their novels. And so they printed them up and stood on them. And I thought that's so symbolic, like to feel like elevated by your work <laughs> and to just see those pages um, together uh, for the first time is really special. So, so that is a really dear memory that I have. Um, and we have some good photos, so I'll have to go back and look at them and remember uh, when we're done. So yeah, so this book, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I was born and raised there. My mother also grew up in Saudi Arabia. Um, basically, my family was there from the 1950s up through the 2000s, um, on and off, mostly on. Um, and I myself left in 1992 with my family when I was about 12. So I write a lot about Saudi Arabia in my nonfiction. And also my first novel was set there, um, kind of a post 9-11 exploration of um, a Saudi American family and their dynamic and how it changes, you know, with the changes, changing political landscape. And this novel is more of an exploration of Aramco, which is the Arabian American oil company, the major company that my father and grandfather both worked for. And the history of that company, you know, I used to think my childhood was not very interesting, which is why my first novel was set outside of an oil compound. It was not to do at all with Aramco or like any anybody who looked like people I grew up with. It really was like rooted in Saudi culture and tradition in this um, sort of bicultural marriage uh, between an American woman and a Saudi man. Um, but, but over time, as I read more and more about politics and the dynamic between Saudi Arabia and the United States, you know, post 9-11 and pre 9-11, I, I just started to realize that actually something very strange <laughs> and interesting was at play. Um, not necessarily 
in the mix of my childhood, which was pretty sedate, pretty suburban. Um, but the fact that I had a sub sedate suburban childhood in the Saudi desert, <laughs> it's like interesting. So, so yeah, I just have really enjoyed um, diving into that history. And this novel tells the story. Um, it's sort of like a story of star-crossed lovers um, insp inspired by the Majnun Layla story, which is sort of like the Muslim world's Romeo and Juliet. Um, only the, the stars of this novel are a Saudi boy and an American girl. Um, and the section I'm going to read is from the, towards the opening of the book, when Lucy is the girl and she grew up in, on a compound, much like me. And she basically was, she, she and her family left in a hurry, kind of under mysterious circumstances. And she never heard from, um, Ra'if, who was the Saudi boy that she was like childhood friends with, and they had fallen in love and, um, and she just never heard from him again. Like, and it was this mystery she had never had closure um, with. And so she now is graduating from college and she has a boyfriend. Um, and so this scene opens with them sort of toward the end of their senior year of college um, as she starts to kind of hatch, plant the seed in his mind of potentially returning to Saudi Arabia um, because of course, she wants to go home. She considers it her home, but she also, I think, subconsciously wants to find out what happened with Raif. So um, yeah, I'll just, that was a very long-winded opening, but <laughs> um, I hope that helps this to make a little more sense. Okay. One night close to graduation, as she and Ward lay tangled together on his narrow bed, listening to Johnny Cash, he turned to her and asked her to marry him. She laughed, she hadn't expected it. She said, yes. Good, he said, now help me figure out what the hell to do with my life. She pretended to bite his neck. I'm serious, Luce. Dad's got an office prepped and ready for me. I have to have a good excuse to say no. Would it be that bad working for your dad? Seems to have treated him all right. He gave her a look. My father could drive from the office to the golf course with his eyes shut. There's a chair at the club with a perfect imprint of his ass on it. Swear to God, the man runs on whiskey and bullshit. Lucy laughed. Not what you're after? He flipped her over on the bed, held her shoulders, and kissed her a little too hard in a way that made her belly go hot. He pulled back and looked at her. Let's do something crazy. Something that'll break dad's heart a little. An idea came to mind. Not a plan, more of a dream, really. She said it almost as a reflex, a Ramco. It was a great childhood, she went on. It would be great for our kids. It was the first time she had mentioned wanting a family. Ward smiled in a dazed sort of way, as if he had never considered this prospect. But now that the idea had been presented, found it favorable. So, she pressed, what do you think? Also, I should mention here, this takes place in 1995. So this is pre-9-11. Um, I don't know, he said, leaning back against the wall behind her bed, hands cradling his head. Convince me. Thanks to her thesis research, the facts were easy. She started with statistics, 10 square miles in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia, 11,000 people, 52 nationalities, capable of, capable of producing more than 10 million barrels of crude a day, the largest oil company in the world. Then she moved on to visuals, cookie cutter company homes laid out with military base precision on pre-planned cul-de-sacs and roads with names pulled from a developer's grab bag of suburban cliche, rainbow circle, Prairie View, Rolling Hills. Forget what you know of oil culture from Houston and Dallas, she told him. Conspicuous consumption, McMansions, etc. Picture instead houses the color of sand, sun-beaten duplexes with threadbare carpeting, factory model kitchens in need of updating. Picture small town 1950s America, quiet streets, kids on bikes, bake sales and parades, and no fear of strangers in vans because each person inside Dahran had passed through multiple stages of vetting in order to claim their spot on the compound. She told him how American camp had been modeled after Bakersfield, California, boxy yards unfold, unfolding before low slung ranch style homes. In the early days, residents drank legally imported beer and ate holiday ham Women drove cars and wore knee-length skirts to work, and each December, employees put on a Christmas pageant complete with braying donkeys, irreverent sheep, and lumbering splay-footed camels, a performance whose popularity among camp residents and Saudi employees alike eventually spelled its doom. Though whether it was shut down because it outgrew its venue or because the government believed it to be a form of proselytizing, 
No one could say. Can you picture it, she asked. I can. He lay flat on his back now, knees bent, arm crooked over his eyes as if to help him better imagine the world she described. Keep going. Inside the cookie cutter houses were families drawn mostly from the American South and West, Texas, California, Florida, Idaho, Oklahoma. Practical people, petroleum engineers and geologists and accountants. In the beginning, there were adventuresome men with nicknames like Krug and Soak and Booger crisscrossing the desert searching for geodesic domes who spent nearly as much time digging their trucks out of the sand as they did mapping the land. Lucy described the men navigating by the stars sleeping in Bedouin tents, swimming in abandoned wells filled with water so clear they could sight the bottom 80 feet down. Living off desert birds shot out of the sky, trading stories with their Bedou guides around the campfire, writing letters home to their sweethearts that weren't quite as lovelorn as the ones they received in return because the men were, for the most part, having a grand time on that desert frontier. Ward's gaze drifted to the window where outside the sounds of a game of touch football filled the air. He was a Texan, couldn't help his frontier dreams, imagining himself descended from men who could find true north by the stars, men who rose to any occasion bravely and without complaint. So next she described Barger and Steinecke and the rest of the early explorers, the way they posed in black and white photos wearing Arab robes alongside their Bedou guides, could wire radiator fans out of disassembled radios and dispatch a gazelle from a hundred yards. Listen. After the geologists came the roughnecks and wildcatters, men with grease under their finger fingernails and little patience for Saudi Arabs who seemed useless to them, not knowing any English, not knowing numbers well enough to even use a ruler. The men wondered how would they be expected to do a massive job like this when they had no laborers to do it with. Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, even these places were better than the new Saudi nation where the people seemed to be straight out of the Old Testament with their beards and illiteracy, their donkeys and superstitions and ignorance of industry and its requirement requirements. By the way, these are the opinions of these extremely <laughs> bigoted early oil workers, not my own opinions. <laughs> sure, the Saudi grunts called the Americans Sahib, but given the dearth of competent underlings, the honorific lost some of its shine. The bosses back in San Francisco, the suits, the ones dreaming in dollar signs, the ones who had already pumped a cool million into the project began to get fidgety. They had the impatience of rich men who had never had to wait much for success. How much longer, they asked Max Steinecke, he of the prophet's beard and great height, he with a nose for oil. Faith, Steinecke replied, and his men on the ground, he said, and to his men on the ground, he said, buck up. There was no such thing as easy money. There was a fortune to be had from those Saudi jebels. They just needed more elbow grease. And for God's sake, don't cause trouble with the Saudis. Don't beat or provoke them because it was only by the grace of the king that they were there at all. And if the king tired of explaining to his people why the white shaitans were riding the dunes on their mechanical beasts, and if the trial wells kept coming up empty, then they could very well be sent packing. Drill deeper, Steinecke said, which the men did. They drilled deeper than oil had ever been found. Finally, a demam number seven hit pay dirt. Lucky number seven. Soon the king came with his entourage and parked beside the wildcatter camp to see for himself, magisterial in his bisht, commanding, magnetic, the men said to their sweethearts back home when they described Ibn Saud. In truth, they were a bit afraid of him because he was a large man, imposing, and it had not been so long ago that he had slaughtered his rival countrymen, even his one-time allies, the dour and devout Ikhwan, in order to take control of the peninsula. He still carried in his belt a long curved sword and traveled with a small army of soldiers whose bodies were laden with an arsenal of bullets, bullets they knew how to place. The Americans had witnessed their marksmanship on mapping expeditions where they shot rabbits the Americans couldn't even see for they were the color of sand and quick. That accuracy came with hardly any practice because bullets were a valuable commodity. No Saudi sat around firing at tin cans to become a better shot the way the Americans had as boys growing up in places like Boise and Midland. Just remember, the Arab is always right, one of the Aramco men told a crew of employees who had just stumbled from the plane after a three-day journey from New York and who were nearly to a man hungover and stinking of whiskey, their flamboyant clothes rumpled, the high mood in which they had departed dampened by hellish heat, the barracks-like fly-infested quarters, and the withered hand they'd seen hanging from a fence post on their way into the camp from the airport. Punishment for theft, they were told by the driver. Lovely country, one of them remarked. 
You don't know the half of it, the driver replied. The year was 1946, the world ravaged by recent conflict, but seemingly smaller than ever, at least to these men, many of whom had fought in the war and were restless with life in vast, silent America, which didn't know what to do with them. So these men chose Saudi Arabia because they had never heard of it before, and that increased the likelihood they would never be found. Lucy paused to drink water from the glass by her bedside. Out the window, the setting sun was an ember against the darkening horizon. She placed a hand at Ward's temple, stroking his hair. Ward, she asked quietly. A pause. Yes. Are you asleep? No. What do you think? He pushed himself up on an elbow. Why not? White space. Lucy loved airports and airplanes, a result of knowing from an early age the frisson of excitement that an overnight flight to a new land could deliver. Even the long wait in the small Dahran airport yielded its own pleasures. The unexpected joy of a school friend booked onto the same departing flight, the men kneeling to pray in the small red carpeted enclosure next to the vending machine, the short blustery walk across the tarmac to board the jet, holding tight to Yvonne's hand while orange lights blinked stolidly in the darkness. When then there were the glorious European airports with their duty-free shops smelling of fine perfume, their currency of gold wrapped Swiss chocolates and jewel like discs of designer eyeshadow and the big transcontinental jets, their Dedelian audacity, so many of them rushing off to this or that far flung destination, Shanghai or Rio or Copenhagen, places with names that felt velvety on Lucy's tongue. Even the airplane food delighted her the compartmentalized tray, each square, one square each for entree, salad, dessert, the thrill of peeling back the foil to uncover the steaming food beneath. She always ate slowly, aware that this ritual would be the most interesting thing to happen to her in the long hours to come. When the cabin would go dark and the grown-ups would slide masks over their eyes and fall into fitful slumber, and she would be left alone blinking into the dimness, studying each body that stumbled down the aisle to use the WC and pretending out of pure boredom that they were monsters come to gobble her up. Now she was tucked in close to Ward on a 747 bound for Charles de Gaulle, la lune de miel, such a pretty expression. The cabin lights had been extinguished, little reading spotlights illuminating the two of them like players on a stage. From behind her paperback, she watched her husband. He was nursing a bourbon, paging through Wallace Stegner's discovery an account of the early Aramco days for which the company had paid him before burying the book for being too honest. Lucy had given it to Ward as a wedding present. She cracked her window shade and peered into the night, imagined the dark Atlantic churning frigidly below them. The thought made her shiver. She reached for Ward's hand, pulling his arm over her shoulder and burrowing against him. Her feet were tucked up under her, cocooned inside scratchy airline blankets like when she was a girl except now she had a generous pour of red wine on her tray table. Of course, her mother would never understand. For all of Yvonne's squalling about the circumstances under which they had left Aramco and the years she spent blaming Lucy for screwing up her father's promotion, one that would have secured for them the wealth Yvonne felt they deserved, Yvonne had loathed Dahran. What was a woman like her expected to do in a place with no galas, no society to speak of? Play bridge and attend women's clubs meetings, she soon learned things too provincial for her taste. Dahran had been one thing and one thing only to Yvonne, a place to get rich. On several occasions, Yvonne had told Lucy the story of how they wound up in the kingdom as if trying to remember for herself, how an oil wife in mink and kid gloves had come into the makeup counter at Neiman's where Yvonne worked. And after an hour's chat during her makeover had convinced Yvonne that Aramco would be the perfect place for a man like Frank. When Yvonne got home, she did some research and decided she liked the gold rush promise of Aramco, the inflated tax-free salary and paid vacations. In fact, she felt a move like this to be her only option if she wanted to achieve the lifestyle she'd imagined for herself. Getting out of El Paso hadn't been enough for Yvonne. In, fra in fact, Frank wasn't enough for her, but she only discovered his lack of ambition after they married. And as a Catholic, Yvonne had few means of recourse. So she resolved to work with the raw material God had given her to make Frank into the kind of man she needed. She had, he had leading man looks and Yvonne, in Yvonne's mind, looking the part was the first step in the process of becoming. So with a bit of embellishment on his resume, she vaulted her husband from a low level managerial job at Texaco to a promising position at the world's largest oil company.
Yvonne did not try to shield Lucy from the disappointment she felt in her husband. In fact, she used it as evidence of the perils of marriage to the wrong man. Somehow, her mother's failure in this area made her the leading expert on Lucy's prospects. Yvonne had immediately approved of Ward. She only had to hear his name, in fact, and Lucy had felt guilty and then gleeful, knowing that with Ward, she had managed to pull one over on her mother, who would never suspect that a man who stood to inherit his father's thriving business would agree to venture halfway across the world to a place where the name Hale held no sway. White space. Paris went too quickly, an impression of Kier Royale sparkling beneath bistro lights, of laughter echoing across the Louvre courtyard at midnight, of supercilious waiters and entitled pigeons and lonesome gray buildings darkened by sudden rain. In the Jardin de Luxembourg on an unseasonably warm spring day, children launched toy boats into the fountain, their giggles trilling the air as if they were freshly emerged from an impressionist painting and not real children at all. Lucy and Ward opened a bottle of white Bordeaux cracked a baguette in half, spread it with camembert, and sat blinking into the anemic sun. Eventually, Lucy pulled some Baudelaire out of her shoulder bag and let the words fall off her tongue in a drunken jumble, stretching her legs across Ward's lap. Even the language was delicious. He stroked her leg contentedly and from time to time let out a little laugh, as if he couldn't quite believe his good fortune. She knew they were terribly cliched in that moment, the Paris honeymoon, the baguette by the fountain, but she didn't care. It was a languid ecstasy, life so perfect she wanted to weep. She was grateful for everything, for Ward's stubble, which had given her a rash from kissing so much, for this snobby city that was unmoved by their love, even as its hundreds of cozy restaurants and verdant parks were sustained on lovers just like them. She was grateful for these children who would never be hers, and for crusty bread that cut her mouth when she bit into it. Even the blood's iron tang was good. She wanted to remark the moment because for once, love was something she could touch. Unlike her first experience of it, when it felt like a mosquito bite on her neck, an itch always just out of reach. She and Raif stealing around like criminals, their affections fed on a partness. Had it ever even been love? More like delusion or a higher class of yearning, though maybe the heart couldn't tell the difference. White space. The cabin lights came on with a rude fluorescence, a woman's voice over the intercom, profusion of Arabic syllables that didn't fit smoothly together as they did on the page, but ricocheted off of one another percussively. Dahran was the only word Lucy recognized. She felt nauseous. She slid the sick bag out of the seat back compartment and clutched it with both hands, which shook lightly as if she'd taken a chill. When she blinked, the darkness dissolved slowly. She set the bag in her lap and looked straight ahead, trying to focus on the shiny dome of skull belonging to the man in front of her. Luce, you okay? Ward looked at her with concern. I forgot how bumpy it is coming in. The wind off the desert, she held up the bag apologetically. Here, he said, handing her half of empty, a half empty bottle of water, which she sipped cautiously. Around them, women were pulling headscarves from carry-ons, disappearing their hair beneath black nylon. Ward indicated the women with his eyes. You bring yours? She'd forgotten to pack anything in her carry-on. Her mother's old abaya and hijab were folded neatly in her checked baggage. It wasn't that she'd forgotten the rules. It was just that they hadn't applied to her before. She had been a child and an American one at that. She wondered what else would strike her differently now that she was grown. The landing gear unfurl unfurling vibrated through her body and soon the plane alighted on the tarmac. A few people applauded as the jet heaved forward. Ward took her hand and squeezed. How does it feel to be back? She wanted to say fantastic, but she couldn't make her mouth form the word. In fact, her mouth was suddenly so dry, she couldn't say anything at all. She twisted off the water bottle's cap and drank. She was too warm beneath the blanket and kicked it off. She thought of that final night in Saudi years before, the way her mother had yanked her from the house by her collar when she refused to leave, the rushed drive to the airport, her mother saying, I will never forgive you for this, the hollowed out sick-like feeling that lingered for months. The plane was taxiing now, the cabin alive with movement. Someone had sprayed perfume, a heavy scent engulfing them. Lucy? She cleared her throat. The tightness in the chest, tears hot behind her eyes. It's a little much, honestly. Come on, said Ward, putting an arm around her. It's going to be great. They deplaned onto the tarmac, the smell of jet fuel, the rush of hot air that clung to Lucy's face like plastic wrap, sky the color of dust. Inside the airport, an official checked their passports without a word, waved them through. She felt relieved, as if she might have been on some blacklist, never to be allowed back. 
everything so familiar yet removed, like watching an old home movie. At customs, an agent rifled through their suitcases, spilling Lucy's brightly colored blouses across the metal table. Ordinarily, this would have upset her, but she was too distracted by persistent deja vu. Her eyes wandered onto the large frosted glass doors at the back of the airport, which slid open to swallow each exiting person. Beyond the doors stood a crowd of men in traditional Saudi dress, white thobes, and red and white checkered shimas, waiting for the new arrivals to emerge. Lucy remembered how he had waited there for her, keeping his sunglasses on out of fear of being recognized by a relative or a friend. The thrill that fizzed through her body as she stood exactly where she was now, knowing what lay beyond those glass doors. Panic that their plan wouldn't work out because by then, after a five hour flight from Heathrow, she was wolf-like, ready to take a ravenous bite out of Rodiff's neck. How she restrained herself with martial discipline, allowing not so much as a smile at the sight of him. When he walked, he led with his chest, shoulders back, chin tilted slightly upward. It stirred something in her, a warm wooziness, like she'd swallowed a glass of wine too fast. This is what people go mad from, she had thought. The convergence of physical and soul affinity too much for her frame. So it seemed to walk beside her, dimensional, telegraphing her desire to him. But if he noticed, she couldn't tell. He turned to lead her to his family's suburban, his indifference so complete she wondered if she'd lost him. If he might try to pretend that his dozens of letters to her in boarding school had been a mistake, blame it on a manic episode. Aware of the rush hour cars pressed close, they drove through the city in unbroken silence. Then on into the desert, the road emptying out, the horizon vast as she'd remembered. At last he reached to take her hand and she felt a desperate constriction in her body. So she bit him hard at the base of his thumb, drawing blood before licking it away, nursing the wound she had created. White space. Now, as Lucy and Ward made their way through those glass doors, she wondered if this was where Raif had been all these years, at the arrivals corridor of the Dahan International Airport, waiting for her return. She craned her neck, peering at the men who thronged there. Already, she was searching. Thank you. It's so exciting to read, to hear work that isn't out in the world yet. <laughs> Thank you. And it's, I always love um, when people have worked on, pro read from projects they've worked on while they've been at Vermont Studio Center. It's always oh, like- That would be fun. <laughs> extra special. Extra special. Um, yeah, so that, that book has been in progress for a while. And I'm wondering, um, after your first draft that you completed at Vermont Studio Center, what was the next step in the process? What, um, do you go through several more drafts after that? And um, I, I, I'm a poet, so I, I don't, I've never worked on a project that's taken several years. Well, I mean, my manuscript is taking several years, but uh, as far as like um, contending with like a larger project that has many, many, many narrative, like longer narrative. Anyway, I'm just, I'm wondering if you only focus on one project at a time or are you, can you work on more than one thing um, or do you just focus on one project or one book at a time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I very much envy poets, their sense of completion you must have, like when you write a poem and you're like, yes, all right, like I've got a draft <laughs> and then you can revise it, you know, what a joy that must be. I, man, revision is really complicated and hard um, with a, a book this size, with a book any size, um, just a book length manuscript. Um, but particularly this book, I think when I finished it at VSC, it was like, was it like 500 and something pages? I think it was over, it was like just about 500 pages. Um, so like a lot, it was a lot of book. <laughs> um, I think it was over, I think it was like 530 or 540. Now it's like 470 or 460. So I was able to chop, condense, streamline a lot because it was just a big mess. There was so much in there that like didn't need to be and that there was stuff that I needed to amplify and expand on, you know, so it's just like 
when you finish that rough draft, what's wonderful about it is that then you can reread it and be like, okay, what am I trying to say? Like, what do I actually have here? And it's like, you've got this raw material finally that you can then kind of play with. So it's, it's actually a really great feeling, even though of course it can be daunting. And that second draft that I started that same summer, once I got home, back home, uh, took me many months, almost a year to do the second draft that I needed to do. So that was a whole nother process because like, and I tell my students this all the time, like your second draft sometimes will be a really long process and maybe it'll be messier even than the first (laughs) because you're still trying to like figure out proportion and balance and you may have to add whole storylines or you may have to change the point of view. You may have to make these macro changes that you don't know how how they're gonna affect the sort of ecosystem of the manuscript. So, um, you know, to just be patient with that process, I think is, is such an important skill for uh, the prose writer. And, you know, I'm not a very patient person, but I think <laughs> I'm also like a very driven and obsessive person. So that, that stands me in good stead. When I start to get impatient, I'm like, okay, there's no rushing it. Like you, you gotta just succumb and like give into the process because it, it will own you. Like you will never own the process. Um, <laughs> you're at the mercy of it. So, so just like, and, and it's kind of a nice feeling to just be like, okay, I'm gonna just work with this material and be patient and just write it out um, and see what comes of it. So, so yeah, then after that second draft, which I finished, you know, nine or 10 months later um, after my residency, then, you know, there were, I want to say two more drafts, maybe even three more drafts. And with each refinement, it's very satisfying to see it really, I mean, it must feel like a sculptor, you know, you're, you're really sculpting and you're seeing the shape finally, like emerge from the raw material. So the rough draft, I don't know, at least for me, the rough draft is really just like a big chunk of clay. Like it's not really like a work of art yet at all it's just the raw material and then it's my job to mold it and and shape it and sculpt it and that's just such a long process so i've taken a break i i stopped working on revising um i want to say like in february or march and i'm just sometimes you just need that space from the manuscript once you do get it refined to a certain point to really see, cause then it's a matter, it's very surgical to be able to see like, okay, what do I actually need to make this final finished complete, like ready? Um, so I'm looking forward, I'm actually getting excited again to look at it, um, but that takes a while too. Um, and that's another thing is like, you have to take breaks um, and rest because you can't really go a hundred percent on the same project for six, seven, eight years, you know? So there have to be those moments of (laughs) rest, restoration, like relaxation. So I, and especially after this last spring teaching and writing and, you know, with COVID, uh, you know, it was also depressing and anxiety producing. So I really just gave myself a pass this spring to just teach, focus on my students and just think about my book sort of distantly. Um, and in the meantime, work on sort of short things. But um, I'm, yeah, I'll probably return to the novel again and you know, start in the fall and hopefully do one more big revision and then it'll be there or close to being there. <laughs> but to answer your actual question about like, do I work on more than one thing at a time? Not usually, like I don't have that kind of, um, I just can't do that. I, I think I really do well when I'm thinking about one long project and I'm really just immersed in it and give myself over to it. Um, and then, you know, that's not to say that I don't sometimes want to write a short story. Like I have definitely written essays and short stories like in the interim um, while I've been working on it. But, you know, it's just hard because I want all my energy and focus to be on the book. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I totally understand that. And um, I, I was, I, I was surmising that that was your process, but I wasn't sure. So that's why I wanted to ask. And yeah. was that process similar for your first two novels as well? Like, or, I mean, I guess the first one is the first one and you're learning. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, so you, you like write a lot and then you pull or in like shape and that's 
than the the process has worked for the last two novels as well. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, it was interesting with my first two books, I think before I was in academia, I like never worked on any short fiction. Like I, when I first started writing fiction, I didn't even start writing short stories. I started writing my first novel. Like that was how I got into fiction. Oh, okay. And um, so I had never really been a short story writer, which was a problem when I was in an MFA program. <laughs> And people really want you to turn in short stories. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Like I'm working on my book. And so I'm just going to give you chapters that aren't going to make any sense to you and deal with it, you know? (laughs) So that was not maybe the most, like the best use of my MFA time. But again, it's what I was working on. And like, I didn't, I was obsessed with my book and I didn't want to take a break even for like a week to write a short story. Also, I didn't know how to write a short story. So, (laughs) so I was like, okay, I'm not going to bother with that right now. So with those two books, I was really just really a novelist. And that's how I saw myself with this book. I definitely, I think being in academia, of course, you start thinking about like publishing, you want to get your work out there, um, you know, for the tenure process. And so I definitely started to be more aware of like, okay, like maybe I could write an essay or write a short story um, and try to publish it like while I'm, and also (laughs) you get really tired of waiting, right? For the gratification of like publishing something. So it's, it can be fun to like write a little essay and get your work out there. So I've definitely done that a little bit more with this book because it's now been five years that I've been working on it, on this novel. Um, But yeah, I would say the process for this book and then my first Saudi book, which was, it's called The Ruins of Us, um, was very similar in terms of like, yeah, just writing a really rough draft and then um, shaping it. With my second novel, that book was just a much quicker um, book to write for me. And I think it's because it had nothing to do with my life. Like it was all from the imagination. It oh, didn't really require much research. Yeah, I was gonna um, ask you about it because uh, I'm almost done. Oh, thank you. I'm on, what page am I on? I'm on page 213. Awesome. A mercy chapter. And it's the start of part two. Um, and I want to know, I want to know what happens. I want to know like who, who left the baby in the dumpster. (laughs) And I was like, "Mm, she was like, spent part of her, like you as the author lived in Texas. And I was just, wondering like how much research you did and if you're saying that. And I also am very fascinated in alternating points of view and the choice that that the author makes to to tell a story with alternating points of view. Um, And I know that you also um, did that for your first novel as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, And I was interested in, you know, because in their second novel, you know, Mercy's first person and then Il- Ila is mm-hmm. Ila is close, close third, um, and you know the, those decisions that you made um, for point of view are, are are always fun to talk about. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on any of that, but um, yeah. reading about the purity ball, I was like, wow! Like I, I felt like I was learning about like Texan culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a southern thing, too. You know, it's not just. Texas is its own weird hot mess. I mean, and particularly now they're really going out of their way to be especially (laughs) disastrous um, politically, but that's another story. Um, But yeah, with that book, the choice about POV was, was definitely very deliberate because Mercy, you know, she's definitely the center of that book. She's the soul of the book, but she's also like really limited in terms of her, self-awareness and her understanding of her own situation um, with her grandmother and her family. You know, she's from this very religious background and that's all she's ever known. And so I wanted through that kind of close, that first person to represent the limitations of her perspective and for the reader to feel both an intimacy with her character, but also to feel sometimes like how that could be that intensity 
Um, and that that sort of siloed perspective can be dangerous um, and claustrophobic. And so and then with Illa's character, I wanted her to sort of offer the reader a bit of a reprieve from that intensity of Mercy's perspective. So with that third person, that close third, which is my favorite POV to write in, um, because I just think it's kind of more elegant, um, at least when I write it, and it allows you a little bit of um, distancing. So if you want to do a little more zooming out, you want to sort of have there be a slight discrepancy in like what the narrator knows and what the character knows, there can be that flexibility. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted Illa to be able to offer us perspective on Mercy that she doesn't have herself, that she can't offer us, so that we see Mer Mercy's life like for what it more likely is than because the way she sees it is somewhat delusional or like, you know, she's sort of trapped in this situation. So that was my thinking behind um, that perspective. And then I also wanted, you know, with Mercy to represent that spiraling that she goes through, um, you know, and that when she does sort of, when she is struck by the mass psychogenic illness that, you know, hits her and the other girls, I wanted to sort of show how that lands in her body um, because her body, you know, she's the star athlete. It's such an important part of her identity. And so for her to feel like that loss of control over her body, you know, is a big part of her character development. Um, so I thought that that would be interesting to render in the, in the first person. Um, yeah. So, so POV is always tough and it's, it's, it's hard to, and that's, and it's so important. Like you have to figure out the point of view and how that structural choice, how you want to tell the story early on, uh, but you can't really force it. You know, you've got to kind of be patient and wait for the voice of the story to emerge and to think about, okay, who are the like shareholders? Who are the stakeholders in this, not shareholders, stakeholders in this narrative and who's really, whose story is it going to be? Um, so yeah, and I like the alternating um, points of view. I think for me as a writer, I would struggle with just a single character telling the story. It, to me, might would start to feel a little flat. And I think particularly when I'm telling like a larger political narrative, like in my Saudi books, I really like to have the alter the American and the Saudi perspectives um, because otherwise it's just such a one-sided conversation. Um, and, you know, it can't really represent that relationship um, in its full complexity with just like the American perspective. Yeah, I have a question about that because I watched an interview with you and um, you said something like the fiction writer is not a propagandist. Um, the fiction writer sets out to explore characters within a society. Um, but I'm wondering like, because you do have an opinion on the society or, but the, I mean, when, when does like, I wonder how that creeps in, you know, like with certain characters or um, which, which point of view is privileged or, you know, those choices. Um, because you, I, I can't imagine you feel neutral um, as a writer taking, taking on like, you know, the Saudi, Saudi oil companies. Um, I, you know, yeah. I, I don't know, like I am, um, may, I may be overstepping, but. Um, no, not at all. I, I, I thought that, that you saying that was interesting in that, in the interview I watched, um, that the fiction writer is not a propagandist. Um, yeah, I think that, that that particular answer was more a response to <laughs> when I wrote my first novel, um, it was really sad to me because my my dad was living in Saudi Arabia at the time when I was writing it. And my dad has a lot of Saudi friends and, uh, you know, many of them work for Ramco and, and, you know, they're sick and tired of like being misrepresented in the Western media or like maligned or stereotyped. And I totally get that. And my first book does not channel or peddle in stereotype. But what it does is it does what any work of fiction does, which is to explore complexities, darknesses. Like, it's not like a cheerful tale of like, 
here's my like accomplishments and here's what's wonderful about Saudi Arabia and here's what's wonderful about America, you know, and they, here's how they get along. Like that, that kind of book, in fact, it's hilarious. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm zooming atop my own like sort of company propaganda books <laughs> that were written about Aramco by Aramco. And for a long time, that was the only history that was really accessible. And now there are wonderful scholars who are going in there because it was very hard to access this material because it was such a closed society. Yeah. But now there are lots of interesting scholars like this woman, Rosie Bashir at Harvard um, and Robert Vitalis at UPenn who are doing this really important like critical work on the history of Aramco and the American present there. That's fascinating. Um, but I think my, my dad's, a couple of my dad's friends, um, they, when I would, I would write them, it wasn't even that they read any of my novel, but I would write them with questions about like, um, you know, certain cultural questions. And they sensed that I was going to be talking about, you know, this is a post 9-11 novel. Of course, I'm going to be talking about like um, extremism. And um, of course, I'm also going to be talking about the American role in like fomenting that extremism too. So, you know, nobody's getting off the hook in that book. Um, but if I have to deal with that. I mean, this family has an American mother and a Saudi father and their children are biracial, bicultural. And so it was just as perfect territory to examine some of these questions. Um, and, and so my dad's friends, I would ask them these questions and they're like, wait, you know, they just knew that I was going to talk about terrorism and they were so upset. And they were like, we thought you were writing like a positive book about Saudi Arabia. And I was like, you know, I'm a novelist. I'm so sorry, but like, I don't write positive books about anything. <laughs> so like my books are called The Ruins of Us and The Unraveling of Mercy Lewis. Like, come on. <laughs> like, it's not, a, they aren't happy stories. Um, it doesn't really matter where they're set. So, you know, so that's kind of what I meant with like the fiction writer's not a propagandist. Like we're kind of negative Nellies. Like we have to be, we have to look critically at our, at society. Um, but I also get sort of what you're getting at too, which when you're talking about like which voices get privileged and like how the writer's biases enter into the writing process, which is absolutely a thing. And it's absolutely th that those biases, those blindnesses, blind spots, those exist. And, you know, this is all part of that larger question about cultural appropriation, you know, which is something I'm constantly engaged with, with my students at Kenyon. In fact, we're having um, a pedagogical seminar in the fall uh, taught by Paisley Rechtal, who just wrote that great book, Appropriate. Um, and she's gonna lead so for the faculty. It's so good. Um, and then she's also going to lead one for the students. And I'm so excited because there's so much, there's so many questions around that uh, issue um, and that subject. And so I think it'll be really nice to talk about it very openly and not talk about it just like when someone messes up <laughs> in, yeah. in their story, you know? So that's what I've started to do in my workshops is to talk about it openly from the beginning. Like this is part of craft guys. Like we need to talk about it. And we're not going to talk about it just when somebody writes something that's sort of problematic because yeah. it puts them on the spot. Uh, we're going to talk about it right now. So you can be thinking about these questions up front. And, you know, these are questions I've been grappling with since I, I've started writing fiction, because as I expressed, I feel very strongly that I want to write from the Saudi perspective and the American perspective, because so much um, <laughs> the Saudi perspective is almost non-existent. Um, in stories of Aramco in particular. Um, and, you know, the way Saudi Arabia is represented in the media is so flat. Um, and it's so just, it's not, <laughs> it's not my impression of Saudi Arabia, which yeah. is a country of people. Like it's, a, it's not a country that is its government, just like we are not our country that was Trump, you know, like <laughs> they are not a country of MBS, like people, you know, um, so but that's what I love about fiction is because I can really represent people who were like the people that my family loves and were friends with. And, you know, my mother almost married a Saudi man. And like, so we have these connections with the people that I really wanted to flesh out on the page um, that I, and of course, at the same time too, I think it's important that we hear from Saudi writers. So, you know, there, there are some interesting Saudi writers um, 
who are working in English, actually. And they're publishing, they published a lot of short fiction um, and, and essays. Um, and I've been following their career. So that's been really fun. And I've been reading, you know, fiction that's been in translation um, by um, Saudi authors. So we need more of that that's sort of elevated um, in the West too. But I think it's not just like a zero sum game. It's not either or, it's both and, you know? So I have a perspective that's different because I'm an Aramco brat and I had this sort of childhood straddling cultures. And, you know, so that, and that has its place too um, in the conversation. Um, so yeah, but it's, man, it's, <laughs> it's a fraught, fraught subject. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I hosted Paisley, um, in May, uh, May, I think. And, um, I, I haven't finished reading her, her book, but, um, the, the one on, uh, a, provo a provocation, um, appropriate, um, or appropriate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very excited. That's, that's amazing. I, I'm like so impressed that you're bringing her in and also getting that the students and the faculty are having those discussions because it's so, so important. Um, so important. And I'm really proud. Like Kenyon has this anti-racism fund and they're funding it partly through that fund, which is oh, awesome that's, because that's amazing. it's part of that work, you know? Yeah. So, and and our stu the stu I really want the students to understand and what writers have to understand is it's not about bad or good intentions because of course nobody sets out to like, no literary writer is setting out to misrepresent or appropriate, appropriate. <laughs> but they do sometimes, you know, they do often. Um, and so it's more about like how you can do that work in a way that is honest and to be able to ask yourself the, the proper questions before you engage with the subject Mm -hmm. to know if it's your work to do, um, which is definitely a question that writers should ask themselves. And I think for a long time, like they have white writers have not felt the need for that. But it's not just white writers too, right? It's anybody writing across their identity yeah. um, of different stories. So yeah, it's a rich, rich subject. I can't wait to have Paisley. She seems like she's incredible. I loved her like poetry project that she did as like the P Utah Poet Laureate that was all about the West and the Chinese railroad workers. I mean, she's amazing. So that'll be fun. Yeah, she read, um, she read uh, pieces from that and talked about that project. Um, it's, it's an, it, yeah, I was like, I was like, I, <laughs> I was like, I was just impressed with like the ambition and like, like the verb behind it. Um, and yeah, all those favor. Um, do you, would you, I know that we're out of time, but I just was interested in hearing about your foray into memoir and um, maybe what that transition is. And I'm wondering, because uh, sometimes I think that our genre, dis genre distinctions are definitely like market driven. Um, and I'm wondering how you're feeling about working in a different genre and what, what made you gravitate towards moving towards working in memoir? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, our conception of genre um, can be really limited sometimes. But what I love is like when you're talking to writers about it, they're like, <laughs> genre schmanra, you know, like writers don't care. You're yeah. right that it's sort of an imposition from above. <laughs> from on high um, because, you know, I think they, that publishers feel that people need um, things to be classified. I also think that, you know, by putting memoir on the cover of something, I think memoirs, and this is just what I've heard from various like agents and publishing people, it's like memoirs tend to sell better than literary fiction too. So there is some pressure there to use it because it's sort of a a sexier label or I don't know what. Um, so <laughs> what happened with yeah. The Woman Warrior by Maxine Hong Kingston. Because she thought she thought that she was writing, you know, a great American novel, but her publisher wanted it to be labeled as a memoir and then it did win did win prizes in nonfiction. But <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And I have a friend Jennifer Croft whose book um, Homesick came out uh, 
it was published overseas in several different markets as a as a was it a novel? Yeah, as a novel. But then in the U.S., the U.S. publisher wanted to publish it as a memoir. So the book had not changed at all. They just put a different label on it. But like, so she talks about that sort of hybridization and how like she there's not a character named Jennifer in it, but it is her life. It's just like by naming her two main characters different names from hers and her sisters, that gave her some a little bit of distance that she needed to write the book. But yeah, it is, it's very interesting, um, these things that are imposed. Um, for me with writing memoir, I think I'm really struggling with it, honestly. Like, I think I'm much more of like a natural fiction writer. Um, I have a really shit memory, so <laughs> that's part of it. I have like a good emotional memory. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember how that this or that event made me feel. But like, if you were to ask me like, what someone said or what I wore, or like whatever, no. Um, and so I really have relied on my mom a lot um, for her memory of Saudi Arabia and Dahran. Of course, she was an adult too. Um, so we've had some really interesting conversations. And then, and my memoir is centered on both her experience and my experience of coming of age in um, Saudi Arabia. So um, it's been really nice. And I think it's been an escape hatch for me to be, be able to put her story on the page as well. Although friends of mine who read early chapters of the book are like, but where are you in this memoir? <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. Cause I'm like talking about my mom, I'm talking about politics and history. And I'm like, oh crud, like I've got to put myself in there. So <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, Let's go back to being 10 years old or, you know, five years old or 11 years old or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. Um, so, and it's challenging cause you know, you've got to really adhere to a lot of like the rules of fiction, the good narrative rules of good narrative, which are like show, don't tell, like render things in scene. And I've always struggled with that, um, but it's really obvious in memoir when you're doing it because like, otherwise it's just this sort of info dump and it's just really like, <sighs> um, whereas, you know, in fiction you can have all kinds of like language and like imagistic stuff. And so, yeah, so it's been, I love it though. I'm, I, I love sort of teaching myself. I work with a really wonderful memoirist named Ira Sukrungrung and he, I've learned a lot from reading his stuff. He writes a lot of short, pieces that I've read. Um, and yeah, so that's been a real privilege. And I'm just enjoying reading memoirs and learning from them. I'm reading a great one right now that's called Late for Tea at the Deer Palace. It's by Tamara Chalabi, whose you know family was this really powerful Iraqi family. And her father was the one sort of chosen by the Americans when Saddam Hussein was toppled to like lead Iraq. Oh, and wow. Yeah, yeah. So, and she's like a professor of history at Harvard. So she has this wonderful way with like historical detail and, but, and her family story is incredible. So it's really cool to see the capa the capaciousness of the form um, and all that it can contain. Cause I'm really wanting to incorporate politics, history. You know, it's not just going to be me and my mom. Yeah. So how are you, how do you go about your research or, or do you just follow different rabbit holes? Um, <laughs> Honestly, a lot of my research I had already done for the no the novel. So that is that has been really good information. You know, I, I wish my grandparents were still living. They they both were in, you know, Saudi from 1951 to 1969. It would have been great oh, to talk wow. to them. Um, but you know, I it's a lot of it is just talking to my mom about things. Mm -hmm. Um and then going back and sort of unpacking my experience alongside what I know about the sort of geopolitical yeah. um, history and seeing like how those things overlap or intertwine or um, which is really interesting. They puzzle that together. Yeah. Well, that's so exciting. Um, thank you for sharing your process uh, for, for drafting various drafts of your novel and thank you for giving us insight on your current project, um, your memoir, your foray into memoir, your exploration <laughs> into memoir. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been really fun just hanging out and talking and, and also hearing um, pages from your, your, your new novel, um, Novel thank in you. Progress. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate this. This has been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I hope we get to meet in person someday. <laughs>